This video is sponsored by Aura. Legends. The players that are remembered long after their playing days end, and indeed long after they too pass. The players that live on in mythology and reverence, that have influenced the game we see today. They are players who have set records, won championships, and captured our attention, etching their legacies into the foundations of this game. A legend is special, not simply because their talent set them apart, but because their stories transcend the individual. In fact, to me, that is what a legend is. A remarkable player who tells a story that enthralls us. So today, I'd like to talk about the legend of Damian Lillard. How many athletes can you call badasses? All right, sure, most athletes are badass to some degree, almost by virtue of being professional athletes. But what about the ones who stand out for their badassery? And how many of those badasses have a practically unanimous approval rating? In the NBA, there may be only one, Damian Lillard. He checks every box on the badass application sheet. He's got style, substance, and the attitude to back it all up. His list of accolades will only grow, but as of 2022, six all-star teams, six all-NBA teams, including a first-team selection in 2018, was the unanimous rookie of the year in 2013, and named a member of the NBA's 75th anniversary team. He has everything you need to be a legend. An inspiring origin story, an incomparable attitude, a mesmerizing skill set, at least one talent that he is historically good at, and exists in the ever-changing basketball zeitgeist as an anomaly that represents forces and ideas much larger than he is. In fact, with Lillard, I think that might be the most important part. His significance goes far beyond just the year-by-year -year breakdown of how he and his teams have performed. More than anything, I'd like to talk about the greater place that he holds in the game of basketball. His origin story is too important not to talk about though. So let's start in Oakland, California. As you might know, Damian Lillard wasn't very highly recruited out of high school, having attended three different schools in the Oakland area growing up. He was only a two-star recruit when he graduated, and ESPN had him ranked nationally as the 48th best point guard in his class. He did receive a handful of scholarship offers, ultimately deciding to go with the first school that had reached out. Weber State in Ogden, Utah. To give you some idea of the kind of mountain that Lillard was staring at if he wanted to make the league, Weber State plays in the Big Sky Conference. Since 1995, there had been only two players drafted into the NBA from the entire Big Sky Conference. These were not the telltale signs of a future legend. He wasn't going to be able to be a one and done player he would have to spend years in college. He made the most of his opportunities in his freshman and sophomore years, winning conference player of the year and making first team all conference both years. But early in his junior season, he suffered a foot injury and was forced to redshirt the rest of the year. When he hurt his foot, he had emerged as an impressive mid-major prospect, the kind of guy that alumni would bring up years down the road. When he returned the following season, he had become the best point guard in college basketball. That was the season when Lillard took the leap. He led the country in scoring for most of the season, and at season's end was named the Big Sky Player of the Year for the third time and a third team All-American. He hadn't just scaled the mountain. He wasn't just projected to make the league. He had destroyed the mountain. He was the top rated point guard in the draft. On draft night, Lillard was taken with the sixth overall pick by the Portland Trailblazers. It had all paid off. He'd made it into the highest league of professional basketball, but in some ways, he found himself back at square one. Yeah, he'd made the league, but no one knew who the hell he was. Big Sky? Weber State? He had to nurture the chip on his shoulder to prove himself all over again. It was Lillard versus the world. 
So he decided to wear something that would pay respect to the people who had believed in him at every step of his journey, from Oakland, Ogden, and now in Oregon. The letter O. Not zero, O. He rewarded those who had placed their faith in him with one of the stellar rookie campaigns of all time, becoming one of five players to be the unanimous rookie of the year. Even then, everyone knew that Lillard was the real deal. Since then, he has only done more of the same, playing with the same chip on his shoulder and showing the same loyalty to the places that made him who he is. He's developed into a perennial all-star and all-NBA player when healthy, one of the best shooters in the league, a devastating pick-and-roll player, a capable playmaker with an Iversonian willingness to do whatever it takes. On top of all of it, he is one of the celebrated leaders in sports today. He's on the short list of guys you would want to have leading your franchise. We're talking about a Steph and Duncan level of culture guy. ESPN's Kevin Arnovitz profiled Lillard, telling the story of how, on a voluntary workout day, Lillard got a call from Luis Montero, the team's rookie 14th man, who needed a ride to the gym. Lillard doesn't call him a ride, he gives him a ride and stays the entire workout. After the workout, he doesn't take Montero home. He takes him to a tailor, giving the young Dominican a full fashion course. How to combine jackets of different colors, pants of different materials, and shoes of different styles to create multiple outfits with the same basic pieces. All told, the two spent nearly the entire day together, on a day when Lillard could have just stayed home. The craziest thing, the story didn't surprise anyone in the Portland organization. In response to hearing that such behavior was rare from a superstar of his caliber, Lillard just responded, I don't know what other people do. But you know what some people do? They steal. In 2020, 49 million Americans were victims of identity theft and it ended up costing them a combined $56 billion. 37 billion records got hacked in 2020 alone from major social media sites, national grocery store chains, cryptocurrency exchanges, pharmacies, and phone and internet providers. This isn't happening just to people who fall for phishing scams or use bad passwords, which means that unless you want to give up the internet, preventing your personal information from leaking could be completely out of your control. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aura, who is sponsoring this video. Aura's app has a ton of features to help keep you and your information safe. Aura's app uses AI and machine learning to protect your identity online. You tell Aura what email addresses, account numbers, and phone numbers you want monitored, and their algorithms scour the dark web, data brokers, and public records to alert you to any criminal activity fast. It can also automatically request information and data brokers to remove your data from their lists. Aura's app also features a VPN that encrypts your browsing history and allows you to stay anonymous online. And their antivirus software will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. And that's not to mention Aura's password manager, which I couldn't recommend more. Someone becomes a victim of identity fraud every 14 seconds. Don't be the next one. Let Aura do the hard work of protecting your identity. Try Aura for free for two weeks and see if your personal identifiable information has leaked to the dark web and experience all-in-one online security. Start your free trial at Aura.com slash Clayton Crowley. That's Aura.com slash Clayton Crowley. Not once has he ever questioned a coach's decision, put blame on anyone else, criticized the front office, or given anything less than his maximum effort at every available opportunity. He's marvelously authentic and strangely accessible. He frequently interacts with people on Twitter and not in the defensive, looking for a fight, keep my name out of your mouth kind of way. He's just talking to people. He talks some shit, answers questions, and talks about his love of boxing. On Instagram, he started 4 Bar Friday, where aspiring rappers can interact and showcase their talents. He has a talent for rapping himself, releasing four albums and collaborating with artists like Lil Wayne and Snoop Dogg. And he still cares about where he came from. Once he made it into the league, one of the first things he did was bring back an Oakland community event that he loved as a kid, but had been shut down. By all accounts, Damian Lillard is an incredible guy, which makes rooting for him as a player that much easier. And we haven't even talked about his signature skill yet. The thing that sets Dame apart, 
the thing that he does better than anyone is step up at the end of games and deliver. He is perhaps the clutchest player in the NBA today. Maybe Steph is the best shooter ever. Maybe Durant does have a more versatile scoring arsenal. I can't say that Lillard is the best shooter or the best scorer or the best ball handler or whatever, but is there anyone in the league right now that you want taking the last shot over him? Maybe his most iconic shot came in just his second NBA season in his first ever playoff series. The year of our Lord, 2014. The Blazers are playing the Houston Rockets featuring James Harden and Dwight Howard. At this point in time, the Trailblazers hadn't won a playoff series since the year 2000. In danger of squandering a 3-1 series lead, the Blazers are losing Game 6 at home. If they do lose, Game 7 will be held in Houston. In all likelihood, the Blazers would have lost that 7th game. But they didn't have to worry about it, because the Rockets made a costly mistake. When they scored to take a 2-point lead, they left 9 tenths of a second left on the clock. It was all the time Lillard needed to etch his name into history. That alone should have been enough to secure the man's legacy as an assassin. It was the first series winning buzzer beater the NBA had seen since 1997. But then, just five years later in 2019, the Blazers faced the Oklahoma City Thunder in the first round with Russell Westbrook, Paul George, and company. With a 3-1 series lead, in Game 5 in Portland, Lillard caught fire. A franchise record 10 made threes and 50 points. Every one of those 50 points reaffirmed what we all knew about Lillard, but none did so more than the last three. I mean, come on. Who does that? The pure audacity of pulling up from just inside half court to nail another series-winning three-pointer? Badass, dude. There have been nine series-winning buzzer beaters in NBA playoff history. Damian Lillard has two of them. And he doesn't just make the shots at the end of games, either. More often than not, Damian Lillard is going to show up and show out when his team needs him most. He is totally completely, unwaveringly up to the challenge. In 2016, he helped carry a team with the lowest payroll in the league and a projected win total of 26 games to 44 wins in the second round of the playoffs. After he sent the Thunder packing, the Blazers beat the Nuggets in seven games and advanced to their first Western Conference Finals in 19 years. In 2020, he put the team on his back. Three 60-point games in the regular season something only Wilt has ever done. Averaged a career high in field goal percentage, three-point percentage, assists, and points, losing to the eventual champion Lakers in the playoffs. And in 2021, he nearly beat the Nuggets by himself. 55 points, 10 assists, and a then record 12 three-pointers, plus game-tying shots at the end of regulation and the first overtime. They ended up losing 140 to 147 in double OT, but you can literally see Austin Rivers thank the Lord when Dame finally missed. It's just what he does. It's the same stuff that all the great clutch players did. In the big moments, at the end of games, when their team needs to score, and everyone knows the ball is going to them, they still find a way. But for Lillard, it isn't enough, to win a title at least. He's had all the heroics, made all the biggest shots, proven he's capable of leading a team for nearly a decade, but he still hasn't won a championship or appeared in the finals. As of June 2022, Lillard hasn't had an all-star teammate since LaMarcus Aldridge in 2015. That's seven straight years of no all-star, no all-NBA teammates. Which brings us to the weirdest thing about Lillard, and a thing that is weird that it's weird. He is insanely loyal. Of course, the hardest thing about making a video about a player who's still playing is that I can't date myself too hard. I have to leave some kind of wiggle room for things to change, even in the near future. I've been bit by that before. 
But ever since Damian Lillard became a Portland Trailblazer, he has been unerringly loyal to the franchise and the city of Portland. How many superstars can say that? Sure, it's not like Lillard is unique for being a good teammate and leader, but remember, he isn't doing all of this for a championship favorite like the Bucks or the Warriors. He's loyal to the Blazers, a team that hasn't won a championship since 1977 and who hasn't appeared in a finals in 30 years. Lillard is so special in part because he's this perfect little microcosm of a player bucking all of the trends of the modern NBA. Over the last 10 to 15 years, player movement has been happening constantly. The idea of a superstar staying in a situation that provides them no real avenue for a championship for so long, purely out of loyalty, is kind of absurd. The only guys in the league who have been on the same team for longer are Clay, Steph, and Udonis Haslam. And those are all guys who have won multiple championships with the teams that drafted them. Which is why some people accuse Lillard of being loyal to a fault, that he should leave town, demand a trade to a true contender, and try to capitalize on his talents while he's still capable. Isn't that a little bit wild to you? For the longest time, it was a given that the best players in the league would stay on the same team. When LeBron left for Miami, the world came down on him for being soft and for not having what it takes to be a winner. And now, I wouldn't be surprised if there's someone out there who thinks that Lillard is soft and complacent, that he doesn't have what it takes to be a winner, because he doesn't want it bad enough. I mean, let's be honest. Lillard gets to be the guy, put down roots, raise a family, get paid, have his talents recognized, and live, by any metric, a blessed existence. What's wrong with that? It begs the question that I find myself running into more and more as I make these videos. What do we want? Should he leave a place that by all indications he has fallen in love with? And go to a team where he might be the second or third best player also, he can try to win a championship that would validate his career in other people's minds? And what would that ring even matter? What do we value more? A chaste ring or loyalty? He turns this whole rings culture on its head. In the discourse of sports, and especially basketball, an incredible amount of value is placed on championships. That makes sense. It's literally supposed to be the entire incentive and purpose of the sport. But when we compare and evaluate greatness and history, we sometimes act like there's a linear relationship between greatness and championships won. The more rings, the better the player. And that's been the burden that guys like Stockton, Malone, Barkley, and Reggie have had to carry for years. Great players who are remembered as the greats who didn't win. It's the first thing out of everyone's mouth when dissecting their legacies. It's enough of a stigma that tons of great players like Malone, Barkley, Gary Payton, Clyde Drexler, and Jason Kidd all chased a ring in their twilight years, trying to escape the eternal sentence of ringlessness. For GP, Kidd, and Drexler, it worked. They finished their careers having won an NBA championship, all with varying degrees of contribution. But what does it really even mean? Do we think of Dwight Howard any differently since he won a title in 2020? Does it mean anywhere near as much as it would have if he had won in 2009? This is the great thing about Lillard. His loyalty and authenticity have me questioning the entire worth of a championship. Of course those rings don't mean as much. Sure, they keep the players off of the list, but it doesn't really move them around in the hierarchy. There's context to all of this. There's a lot more that goes into a championship than just an extra line on your Wikipedia page. And that is what it seems like Lillard is all about. He has acknowledged the bet he's making. He knows it might not pay off. And yet, he is still willing to take the risk. He talks about leaving as selling out. He's said that he wants nothing more than to win a championship but is quick to point out that he wants nothing more than to win a championship for Portland. When talking about his dream of a championship, he references Dirk Nowitzki's historic tear through the playoffs, culminating in Dallas's first championship in 2011, 
Dirk's 13th season at the age of 32. Lillard wants that. It would mean the same thing for him as it did for Dirk. Sure, it would validate his career as an all-time great, but it's so much more personal than that. It would make him a folk hero. His dream is of a championship parade that drives through the streets that embraced him, past the places that he's come to love. And if he ends up on the list because he wanted it both ways, he's at peace with that. With all of that being said, this video could very well get outdated soon. There have been trade rumors around Lillard for the past few years. The team recently traded CJ McCollum, easily the best teammate Lillard's had in recent years, with the hopes of jumpstarting a new look. He's said that he's happy to stay and see the process through, but maybe he does go to a contender, and maybe he becomes a key piece on a championship winning team. Maybe at some point he tries to pick one up on the way out. Maybe he stays in Portland and never wins one. And maybe he manages to win what would be one of the most satisfying, hard-earned, well-deserved championships in league history. I can't predict the future, so I can only go with what we know. What we know already is that he's an all-time great, one of the best big game performers, one of the best big time shot makers the game has ever seen, consistently delivers in a fashion that leaves you with few thoughts other than an appreciation for what a bad motherfucker he is. And he doesn't need a ring to prove that. Even if his loyalty costs him a championship, I refuse to believe that he will be brought up as a cautionary tale for future generations. If anything, it might stand out as a badge of honor. In the era of player movement and super teams, Damian Lillard has stood defiant. In one of the most competitive eras for guards in league history, the two-star recruit from the Big Sky Conference stands out. Damian Lillard isn't playing our game. He's playing his. Relentlessly, refreshingly, authentically him. And in that way, you really can't lose. How badass is that?